Good evening. Welcome to our webinar on exploring effective male neurology treatments. My name is Louise King and I'm your host this evening. And our expert presenter is Mr. Steve Garnett, a consultant neurological surgeon. Um, this evening, we'll do a short presentation and that'll be followed by a Q&A session. You can ask questions throughout um, at the bottom of your screen using the Q&A icon and we will answer at the end. You can do this with or without giving your name. Um, just to note, this session is being recorded. So if you do provide your name, then um, if other people can see that. Um, the good thing about providing your name is if we don't have an time to answer all your questions, we can then contact you afterwards with the answers. Um, I will now hand over to Mr. Garnett. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. and Hello. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about, particularly about prostate treatments, um, but also a little bit about some, uh, some of the other urology uh, treatments we offer here at Benenden. Um, so I've been a, a, a consultant urologist here at Benenden for quite a while now. So I think 2009 I started here and uh, before that in uh, East Sussex, which is my NHS base in uh, Eastbourne in particular. And I do a lot of uh, prostate type surgery as well as general urology and prostate cancer surgery. So um, we're going to talk about enlarged prostates, what that means and uh, some of the treatment options there, a little bit about um, testicular uh, problems and erectile dysfunction, uh, and we'll come on to that at the end. So the, the, the crux of what we're talking about really is prostate enlargement, which is uh, a normal um, process in, in men as we get older. So uh, unfortunately, the older you get, the more likely it is that your prostate will be enlarged. And that process actually starts at a relatively young age. It probably starts in the 30s and increases uh, over time. And what does that actually mean? Well, this diagram here really gets to the sort of uh, the nub of the matter. The prostate is a gland here that sits just underneath the bladder. And this is the bladder, which is essentially a muscular sac that holds the urine. And the urine is obviously made in the kidneys and comes down to the bladder. And when, when, you, when you pee, you pee out actually through the uh, urethra, which runs through the prostate. Um, and when you're a younger man and the prostate's fine, you, 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 you get a good flow of urine because there's no uh, blockage to the way out from the bladder. Uh, and as men get older and the prostate enlarges, it doesn't just grow outwards, it grows inwards as well and blocks the urethra and causes a restriction in flow, which can make it more difficult to pee. The, the, the flow of urine gets slower. Um, it can be difficult to start peeing. And it can be difficult to completely empty the bladder. And these give the typical sort of prostate symptoms that many men get, uh, which can include getting up a lot at night, having to pee more often, having to rush to the toilet, that type of thing. So there are a number of different treatments out there for prostate enlargement. But what I particularly wanted to talk uh, about this evening is the Eurolift system, which is a relatively new treatment. It's been around a little while now. and We've been doing it at Benenden for quite a few years, um, but it has a number of advantages over some of the more established or longer term uh, treatments, which are a bit more invasive. So the Eurolift can be thought of uh, as an alternative to drug treatment, medical treatment, or uh, in some cases, more invasive surgery, such as TURP or TURP surgery, which is, uh, a very commonly done operation for enlarged prostate. And what the Eurolift offers is a quick symptom relief with a better side effect profile, fewer, fewer complications or side effects than, than bigger surgery um, and good uh, symptom relief. It's better and more effective than tablets. It doesn't have any impact on sexual function, which is a big plus as some other treatments do. Uh, and people can get back to normal activity and work and uh, whatever they want to do very quickly. What do we actually do when we're, we're doing a, a Eurolift procedure? Well, we're putting little implants into the prostate to open it up. So rather than cutting anything away or destroying anything, we're simply pulling the prostate open. So using a, 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 a telescope which goes into the bladder, we're firing these little implants through on either side 
And rather than the prostate coming together and blocking the way out, the sides or the lobes of the prostate are pulled apart to create a nice channel through which you can pass your urine. So what, what does the uh, Urolift implant uh, actually look like? It's actually a little bit of uh, a metal, uh, it, well, it looks like a treasury tag, doesn't it? That's what everyone says to me, but it's a little um, metallic implant uh, with a bit of stitch material uh, between the two ends. And that is tensioned to pull the prostate open. Um, so what does that look like? Well, when we look into the bladder, um, before a urolift, you can see in the lower left picture, you can see the two lobes of the prostate. This is a camera inside the urethra, inside the water pipe, trying to look into the bladder. And you can see the lobes of the prostate on each side are actually meeting in the middle. And there's no easy passage through to the bladder. In the middle picture there, you'll see that the urolift implants have been placed and those lobes have been pulled apart. So that... Uh, opening there is the way in and out of the bladder so there's no prostate tissue causing a blockage in and out of the bladder the final sort of pictures here um, on the right hand side above and below just showing that the important uh, structures which are the the dorsal vein uh, and the nv are the neurovascular structures which are the nerves that uh, run to and from the penis. These are well away from where we're placing these implants, which is why these implants don't cause any impact on sexual function. It's probably easiest to actually show you a video to describe how this works um, in, in real life, uh, because it's, a little, it's always a little bit difficult on these uh, inanimate pictures and things. So I'm gonna play a video, which does have some uh, rather marked American voiceover you, you'll just have to deal with that shortly and then i'll come back to you so we'll hopefully play this and this 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 animation kind of shows you exactly what's happening when the urolift implants are placed the urolift system is a new minimally invasive technology designed to relieve urinary symptoms and improve quality of life for men with an enlarged prostate caused by benign prostatic hyperplasia or bph as the prostate becomes enlarged due to BPH, it presses on the urethra from the outside and causes it to become blocked. Relieving obstruction of the prostate is clinically proven to improve urinary symptoms in men with BPH. Under endoscopic guidance, the urolift system is gently placed into the urethra to the area blocked by the enlarged prostate and moves the obstructing prostate tissue out of the way, thus opening the urethra. Through a fine 19-gauge needle, an implant is deployed that holds the prostate in this new, less obstructed shape. The Urolift system is designed to offer a new way to relieve prostatic obstruction without cutting, heating, or removal of tissue. Next, the same technique is applied to the other side of the prostate. Because the outer capsule of the prostate is typically firm, it holds the urethra open. The number of implants required depends on the size of the prostate and the degree of obstruction. Typically, four to five implants are used. Before applying the Urolift system, the urethra is blocked due to an enlarged prostate pressing on it from the outside. After applying the Urolift system, the prostate lobes are pushed aside, leaving an open urethra. Okay. The uh, Euro I'll, I'll try and move on. Right. Okay. So uh, hopefully that gives you a better understanding of what actually is being done physically to the prostate and the lobes of the prostate uh, during the Eurolift procedure, and uh, shows you, you know, very much in, in visually uh, exactly how uh, this treatment opens opens up the channel uh, out of the out of the bladder, allowing allowing men to pee better. Uh, once this has been placed uh, and by relieving that blockage it actually takes pressure off the bladder which uh, means that a lot of the other symptoms that men get uh, which we uh, refer to as irritative symptoms so that's a feeling wanting to go a lot uh, or maybe getting up at night they they tend to settle down as well once the blockage has been treated now i said earlier that the urolift was a relatively new treatment but the actual the studies started back 
um, 12 years ago now on, on the sort of originally on, on looking at the safety and feasibility of this. And it started in uh, the USA and in Australia. Um, and the first sort of studies published on this were, were 10 years ago now. And a major study was uh, 2013, this so-called LIFT study, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, which was a really important study to show that this uh, was effective and safe and, and lasted. So there have now been a lot of studies done uh, showing the effectiveness of this and the safety of this. And in fact, uh, got a positive, nice appraisal for the NHS um, nine years ago now, or eight years ago, nearly nine years ago, and um, was then widely uh, uh, adopted uh, as, a, as a measure uh, in the UK in 2016. But unfortunately, uh, uh, although it was, uh, you know, accepted, it, it hasn't uh, uh, been easy to for many NHS hospitals to to sort of adopt new new systems. So, it, it, although it's uh, in theory available, it can be difficult to actually get to have this uh, in NHS hospitals. So, in terms of um, uh, sort of studies that have been done. I won't go into too much detail about the studies, but this is an important study, which is worth talking about a little bit because it was a rare thing in, in surgical studies because it involved what's called a sham. And lots of uh, studies, are, it can be difficult in, in surgical studies to prove that a treatment works because it's fairly obvious you've had an operation. But in this study, they actually did a sham operation, which involved putting a telescope in um, <clears throat> into a patient and making a noise which sounded like the uh, Eurolift was being deployed. Um, and uh, so neither the uh, patient, which is the subject, or the people assessing them afterwards knew if they'd had the Eurolift or not. So it was to try and really give uh, what we call a, a double blind assessment. And it uh, was a very uh, well constructed study done uh, both in the USA, Australia, and a couple of centers in Canada. So this goes back some time now, but it was a very important study that, that actually showed uh, that the Eurolift worked very well uh, and was durable uh, and lasted. And if we look at the results, um, there have been quite a few longer term follow up studies now going up to four and five years showing that actually symptoms improve very rapidly. This number here refers to something called the international prostate symptom score and that's sort of an indication of how bad someone's symptoms are and if they have a very high number they have bad symptoms and the number after the urolift dropped down very rapidly and has remained low up to four years uh, and that's a, a very you know impressive uh, results in terms of uh, persistent symptom improvement and now five-year results have been uh, presented and again have shown uh, pro prolonged and persistent improvement in symptoms with a low retreatment rate. So a few people do need further treatment and that's important to note, but it is, it is low. Importantly, um, <clears throat> in, in the studies that have been done, there have been very little in the way of serious or prolonged side effects. Dysuria simply means uh, stinging and burning after passing urine. And most people will get a bit of that uh, for, for the first 10 days to two weeks after a procedure, but it settles down very quickly. And there've been very few uh, more serious problems and no sexual problems at all. And actually there's been very low retreatment rates compared to other treatments for the prostate. So um, if you look at the Eurolift, uh, about 13% um, of people have needed something further doing after five years, which is a, which is a pretty low figure um, overall. And importantly, people are uh, able to get back to uh, their activity very quickly. So this is five days was the average sort of return to their normal activity, which if you compare to bigger operations is very, very quick. Um, so, for people who are working or got uh, things they need to be doing, um, it's a very good procedure allowing you to return to your normal activity very quickly and doesn't restrict you from doing things for very long. Um, 
and this is sort of comparing the urolift with more major surgery and TURP or transurethral resection of the prostate is a good operation. It's been done for a long time and is, and, and is what we always compare new treatments to. And urolift compares very well in terms of overall satisfaction because of the very low side effect profile. I think this is a nice summary slide. What this is trying to show is the positive things about the positive things about each treatment versus the side effects. And what you can see in this is that you get a good positive improvement in symptoms with the Eurolift, which is not quite as good as the bigger operations. But when you look at the side effects or complication profiles of the bigger operations and compare it to Eurolift, Eurolift fares much, much better. So very few side effects, which are generally mild versus more serious side effects with bigger operations. And I think what's really interesting about this slide, for me anyway, as a, as a doctor, um, we often tend to think, not think so much about the side effects of, of, of the drugs that we give patients, but actually a lot of people, a lot of men with prostate symptoms are put on various drugs, particularly drugs like tamsulosin or alfuzosin, which are called alpha blocker drugs. And they're very, effective at improving urinary symptoms a bit but they all have quite serious side effects so asthenia really means tiredness and I see a lot of men in my clinic who just say look yeah the, the medicines do help a bit but I feel tired I feel awful I don't feel like my normal self I get a bit of dizziness get some sexual side effects and really I don't want to keep taking these tablets they're, they're ruining my quality of life and often doctors don't think so much about that uh, when we, we we tend to think about operations and the effect of operations but i think it's really important to remember uh, that that medicines do have side effects and so urolift can be a good option rather than take continuing to take tablets for a long period of time and this is sort of looking at where does urolift fit in and i think that um these these are the alpha blockers i was talking about and i think urolift is a good option actually we often think of it as an alternative to, to, to more major surgery, but it's actually a good alternative to taking medicines for a long period of time. So really, anyone who has prostate symptoms can be considered for a Eurolift. There are some uh, sort of people with very large prostates who aren't suitable and some prostate shapes that aren't don't do quite so well with Eurolift. And we need to do some tests to look into that. But from, from the starting point, anyone who has urinary symptoms could potentially have a Eurolift. And there've been further studies looking at uh, the Eurolift in the real world. Um, so that means outside these sort of tightly confined studies. And this shows again, good ongoing uh, reduction in symptoms and improvement. Um, and uh, this has continued to show large numbers of patients now with ongoing good results. So this always uh, raises a few eyebrows, but this slide is kind of a, a visual representation of what a lot of men uh, find that they're, they're struggling with. And when they, when they come to see either their GP or, your, or a urologist to talk about their urinary problems. And I, I think that um, most of the men I see uh, 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 and uh, will, will recognize uh, this picture as, as, as when we're young men, or boys, we have the uh, competition to see who gets over the uh, five bar gate and we can all pee well up here. And then as we get a bit older, it comes down to here. And then unfortunately, if the prostate really enlarges, we can end up worrying about splashing our toes when we're at the urinal. And, it, and that's really exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about the obstruction to the flow from an enlarged prostate. So one of the first things that you'll have done if you come to see a urologist to talk about your urinary symptoms is something called a flow test. And that is a, a, a more scientific way of trying to judge what your flow is actually like. So you'll come along to clinic and you'll, we'll ask you to pee into a bowl uh, like here on the right, which is connected to a, a something called a flow meter or a flow machine. And that will give us a, 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 a graphic representation of your flow. And it will look like this. And, a, a normal flow in a younger man is a very fast flow getting up to 20 mils per second or more. And once, once you finish peeing, it stops very quickly and that's it. 
but what we see in men with prostate enlargement that's blocking the way out of the bladder it's a slow flow it goes on it's prolonged it might stop and then start again stop and start and you might have a bit of dribbling uh, towards the end and that's that's something that we we want to see to know that the prostate is causing a blockage and that's a simple non-invasive test that can be done at some GP practices and certainly all urology clinics. So in summary, the Urolift is a good uh, minimally invasive treatment for enlarged prostate causing uh, obstructive symptoms. It, it rapidly uh, causes symptom improvement. It improves the international prostate symptom score very significantly and increases the flow very quickly. And most uh, you know, the, the, the improvement is there within two weeks of treatment and it has mild symptoms that are usually nearly all gone by a couple of weeks. Uh, there's no impact on sexual function. Uh, we generally do it under a short general anaesthetic because um, I find that most men find it a little uncomfortable under local anaesthesia, but it can be done under local anaesthetic. Um, it's been shown to have uh, long lasting results up to five years. And there's lots of studies around the world now showing that this is a, a reliable treatment. So it's a good treatment option for many men with prostate enlargement uh, who either don't like the medicines they're on or don't want to have more invasive treatments. So I'm gonna move on just to talk very quickly a little bit about uh, other urological uh, or men's health problems that we see. Um, so in terms of um, what we see a lot in the clinic is testicular lumps or scrotal lumps and swellings. So these are usually um, something called hydrocele's or epididymal cysts. And what this diagram is showing you is that this is the testicle here, but it's not uncommon that men get um, sort of painless enlargement around the testicle. And that is actually usually fluid and that's called a hydrocele. And in most cases, there's no serious cause for that it's just a uh, again something that can happen in men as as we get older and you can get a collection of fluid around the testicle that causes swelling and obviously that can be worrying but usually uh, it's very easy to diagnose that this is a simple hydrocele and nothing worrying occasionally men can get cysts or lumps in the epididymis which is this structure here which runs along the side and the top of the testicle and again this can cause a, a lump next to the testicle which can be worrying and certainly any any lumps or in, increase in size in the testicle should always be investigated and checked out but they're nearly always not worrying in men over the age of 60 and younger men sometimes it can be serious causes but that that is obviously something that can be looked at very easily and very quickly by your doctor so if there is a, a testicular uh, swelling like a hydrocele or epididymal cyst that's causing uh, enlargement. Usually it doesn't cause too much in the way of pain, but what most men say to me is this, this swelling gets in the way when they're trying to do their activities, particularly if they like cycling or um, you know playing sports or things like that. It's, and it can be unsightly, particularly in, in trousers and things. So um, a lot of men do come to see me to seek treatment for this and this can usually be sorted out by a relatively small straightforward operation which can be performed here at Bennington as a day case procedure. We do obviously see a whole range of men's health problems including erection problems uh, and again this is not an uncommon problem uh, in, in men and it's usually due to narrowing of the blood vessels that uh, carry the blood to the penis and uh, it's the same actually the same process that's associated with heart disease because that is also narrowing of the blood vessels um, there can be some hormone problems and there can be uh, some medicines often people are put on uh, medicines for high blood pressure which can actually cause problems with erectile dysfunction so there are a number of things that can be looked at to improve erections and obviously um, again these things can be discussed with your doctor but if if you're not getting uh, anywhere then there are a number of treatments that can be offered usually starting with tablets uh, here at Bennington that we can offer to help with erection problems. Flow obstruction really just is uh, talking about um, what we've just been talking about with the Eurolift but if it gets very severe and gets to the point that 
um, the prostate's causing a complete blockage and that's called acute retention of urine. When, uh, when someone can't pass urine at all and the bladder is very full, obviously that's usually very uncomfortable and painful. And we can all, all know and sympathize with what it's like when you're desperate to pee and you, and you can't. Um, that can cause further damage uh, and problems with the kidneys and things like that, and usually requires an urgent procedure to pass a catheter to drain that off. And then we can look at various treatment options to try and get rid of the catheter and remove the underlying problem, which is usually prostate enlargement. And obviously we've talked about Urolift, which is one treatment for that, as is more uh, invasive surgery, such as TURP surgery, uh, which cause out the prostate, and that may be more appropriate if, you, if, if you've unfortunately got to the point of needing a catheter in. So I think what I'm going to do is stop there at, uh, at this point in terms of what I'm saying about uh, urological problems, and hopefully uh, a few questions have come through, uh, and I'm happy to take questions and, and, and talk through that if, uh, if anyone's got any. Thank you. Thanks. We do have some questions. Um, I think there's a three part question from Ian. So I will start off with the first section. Um, they have an, an, an enlarged prostate and would like to ask why it works fine during the day, but not at night. Yeah, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of men ask me that because, and they do say, look, it's not too bad during the day, but nighttime it's, it's really awful. I think there's a number of factors in that, um, Ian. I think that often men with enlarged prostates don't empty their bladders very well. And during the day, particularly when you're up and about and doing things, or if you're sat down watching TV, or you, you, you tend to be a bit distracted and not so much aware that there is a, a lot of urine left in your bladder. But at nighttime, when you're lying down and you're not doing anything other than trying to sleep, and also in a, in a lying down position, you are more aware of that urine that's left behind in your bladder and it can make you feel like you want to pee a lot. Also, if your bladder gets very full, um, men with prostate problems typically do find it more difficult to pee. So um, the bladder is a muscle and all muscles work best at a certain sort of range of movement. And if the bladder gets very full and overly stretched, then the muscle doesn't work so well. So the flow will be worse then. Uh, and finally, there are a number of other factors that influence um, why people have problems at night. So some people actually, it's not related to their, to their prostate, but they may make more urine than they should do at night and then feel that they constantly need to pee. So that's a slightly different uh, problem. But just because you've got an enlarged prostate doesn't mean that you don't have or can't have that problem as well. Okay. Okay. Um... Stage two is what anaesthetic is generally used for Urolift? So we generally use a short general anaesthetic. Uh, it can be done under sedation. Um, but to be honest with you, there isn't actually much difference between a short, light general anaesthetic and a, a heavy sedation. Um, and um, it's usually easier just to do a short general anaesthetic, but it can be done under sedation and local anaesthetic. Okay. And can Urolift ever be reversed if a different treatment is needed in future years? And has this ever been done? Yep, yep. It's, it, as, as, I, as I indicated, uh, a number of men will have Urolift and then go on to need further treatment. And um, you can still have further treatments um, such as TRP or laser surgery, and that can be done after a Urolift and um, the internal implants are removed during that procedure. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a few hands raised and um, it's best if you type the questions via the Q&A icon if you do have a question or even in the chat icon. Um, we have a question from Stephen, currently suffering incredible pain passing urine and still undiagnosed but and has an enlarged prostate. Well that's been mentioned. Um, you say Urolift lasts five years, what happens after that? So I'm not saying Urolift wears off after five years. I'm just saying that the studies that have been done up to now have only gone for five years. So you, you may well be fine for more than five years um, and you may, not ever, you may not ever need further treatment. But um, with any new treatment, obviously it takes time to find out what the long-term effects are. And that's the, the, the difficulty for new treatments is that we don't know 
long long term what 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 happens but as i've just sort of indicated you can have further treatments and it may be that in five six seven years you need further treatment such as another urolift or another treatment but that those are all options um what i what i would just say on 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 your question and and, and referring to your symptoms actually although um uh, you know enlarged prostate does cause a lot of symptoms it's not usually painful to pass urine so if you've got pain i'd be a little bit worried that you might have a urine infection or another problem um, such as uh, inflammation in the prostate rather than simply just prostate enlargement because that doesn't usually cause pain okay thank you um michael asked what tests are needed to determine suitability for urolift so yeah you'd need to come up for a, a consultation and an examination uh, and do a flow test uh, we'd ask you to complete a, a symptom questionnaire which gives us a sort of uh, idea of how bad your symptoms are and then in most cases you would need um, a, a camera examination of the prostate and bladder just to check that the prostate shape is suitable for the urolift because a small number of men do have what we call a middle lobe or a lump of prostate in the middle rather than at the sides and obviously if the urolift is pulling the sides apart to create a better flow if you had a big lump of prostate in the middle that that wouldn't be such an effective treatment thank you um another attendee has asked if we check for cancer as part of the, the tests for urolift yeah so as part of the test for the urolift i either uh when you come up to see us or often your gp beforehand would do a blood test a psa test on the prostate and then we'd examine you and the combination of that gives us a very good idea of the likelihood of any prostate cancer but obviously if there are any concerns about cancer then further tests would be done and we wouldn't do a urolift before we were happy that that that, that prostate cancer was not an issue thank you um, relating to cancer, um, Thomas said he had prostate cancer and his prostate was removed um, at Eastbourne General in 2016. He now has all the symptoms of prostate cancer again in passing urine with slow flow, as you described, and many times at night. Any thoughts on the reason for this? Yeah, I mean, there could be a number of things there. I mean, clearly, I don't know exactly what treatment you had, but if you if you had... Uh, an operation to fully remove your prostate uh, for prostate cancer, um, <clears throat> then obviously the prostate itself won't be causing any blockage. But what can happen in that situation is you can get narrowing down of where the bladder is joined onto your urethra, your water pipe. And that, that, that kind of scarring that sometimes happens after uh, that type of surgery can mimic the same symptoms as prostate enlargement but again by blocking the way out of the bladder so some further tests may be needed there to work out exactly what's going on thank you um christopher mentions says that one slide mentioned a catheter free after one month can you expand on this and how long are you in hospital so you you're that slide was referring to people in one study who had the urolift when they already had a catheter in. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's a slightly different um, scenario. So most people who we do urolift on do not have a catheter in before or after the procedure. We don't routinely put a catheter in. This is a day case of op operational procedure. So people come in and go home the same day. So there's no, usually there's no need to stay in hospital. A small number of people can occasionally have trouble peeing after a year lift or any procedure on the prostate. So we always keep a close eye on you after the procedure to make sure you're peeing okay. Occasionally people do need a catheter putting in. So I can't give you a 100% guarantee, but most people do not need a catheter. Okay, thank you. Um, can you self-refer for this process or is it via the GP? Uh, you can self-refer for uh, uh, as a private patient to Bellenden Hospital. I think the details are on the slide in front of you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Michael says um, he has a dwelling catheter in place at present and is awaiting a TERPS procedure with the NHS. However, it has a long waiting list. If he was to come to Bellenden for a consultation, can you deal with the catheter in place? 
Yeah, I mean, um, it's difficult to go to go into too many. You know, obviously, I can't give you a consultation right here and now, but we see plenty of patients with catheters in, and it may, and certainly that's something we can deal with at Benenden uh, and talk to you about the various treatment options. It may be that a TURP is the best operation for you, and that is also something we can provide here at Benenden Hospital. So. Be very happy to see you and talk through the options and yeah we can certainly treat you with a catheter in thank you um final question i have at the moment is um is it common for testicular non-cancerous lumps to return after treatment um it does depend of course which <laughs> what treatment you've had and what lump you're talking about but it's not common i wouldn't say it's common for uh, certainly hydrocele's if they're uh, effectively operated on it's not common for them to recur um, they can you can get it on the other side that's possible uh, and epididymal cysts sometimes uh, you can grow another cyst um, so i wouldn't say it's common but it happens occasionally okay suddenly we do have a couple more questions i think we have time to fit these in okay. um Stephen says he's currently prescribed the Tamus Tamusulosin, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, that you referred to earlier. Do you believe this is an acceptable long-term option for prostate issues? So it has been used long-term in, in, in many men, and, and yeah, it, it does appear to be safe as a long-term medication. It's really a question of whether you're happy taking it long-term. If you're taking it and getting good improvement in your symptoms and are not getting side effects, then it's a good option for you and it's safe. But if you're taking it and it's not doing enough, you've still got symptoms that bother you, or you're taking it and you're getting side effects like dizziness, tiredness, stuffy nose, sometimes people get. Uh, also, men can get um, ejaculation problems on that medicine. If you've got uh, that or occasionally erection problems as well, if you get any side effects like that and you want to get off the tablet, then the, the Urolift is potentially an option for you. Okay, um, Richard says he was diagnosed as having a BPE in January 2021 by yourself. He thinks it's at the stage now where he would like to discuss Eurolift. Should he book in a consultation with you again? Uh, BPE uh, is benign prostate enlargement. Um, so, yes, it sounds like you should come back and see me again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a couple more. Um, Ian says he takes a finasteride. So finasteride, yeah. Finasteride, thank you. All these medications I'm not used to say. Um, and has been told and told it's also proven to reduce prostate cancer risk by 25%. Can you comment on your knowledge of this? Um, I would not actually say I'm comfortable to accept that. Um, finasteride is a, is, a, is a useful medication. It, it works to reduce uh, well the way it works is by stopping the conversion of testosterone to a more active form of testosterone so it's a hormonal type of drug uh, and it works by by that hormonal effect it works to slowly shrink the prostate down um, by doing that it also has effects on um, the psa level and also, obviously, by shrinking the prostate, it can improve urinary symptoms. You know, it's not it's, because it's a hormonal drug. It's not a quick acting drug. And you do have to take it for quite a while to get an improvement. But it is it is a useful and effective drug. It does have side effects. And a number of men can get erection problems on that. And, a, and a, a, also a number of men can get uh, breast tenderness uh, as well. So it's not for everyone, but it is it is a good drug and it's the only drug that actually uh, reduces the prostate size um, in terms of uh, reducing prostate cancer that, that that's quite a contentious issue what, what it does do is reduce the PSA level and it may reduce the detection of non what we would call not significant prostate cancers um, whether it has any impact on uh, actual development of prostate cancer, I think is a, a little bit less clear, to be honest. 
Okay, this is our last question we're going to take. Um, if someone had a Urolift procedure three years ago and symptoms how are returning, does it mean the system is breaking down or is further treatment required? I think it's probably more likely that the prostate has grown further. And, um, you know, as, as I've outlined in the, in the sort of study slides and things, uh, there is a retreatment rate. A small number of men every year will find that, that their symptoms have got worse. Uh, after any treatment for prostate enlargement, uh, including Urolift, in, and also including more major surgery. So the prostate can still continue to grow. And if that gets to a point where the symptoms are getting worse, then it is possible that you may need further treatment. But what, what I would say, uh, which is worth bearing in mind, is you know if you have a relatively uh, minor treatment, a small treatment, like Eurolift, but it's done as a day case that has relatively few side effects, then actually, if you did need to have it done again after three, four or five years, that may not be the end of the world. It's clearly a personal decision and something you need to think about. But um, some men would prefer to do that. And some men would prefer to have a bigger treatment with more side effects, but a slightly lower risk of needing something doing again in the future. It's a balance that you have to consider. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much for everyone typing in your questions. It's great to have a good conversation at the end. Um, if there are any more questions coming up and you haven't asked yours, so please just let us know your name and we can answer those. Um, if you'd like to book a consultation with Mr. Garnett, um, the details are on the screen there and we are offering 50% off your consultation until the 5th of, if you booked by the 5th of January, you just need to quote the webinar on the subject line. Um, at the end of this, you'll be, a survey will pop up um, and we'd really appreciate it if you could complete the survey. It gives us feedback on the webinar process, the booking, um, the bookings areas onto the Zoom webinar and um, Steve as well, would be great to give some feedback for him. Um, our next webinar is actually this Wednesday. It's on ear, nose and throat symptoms and it's with Mr. Hone and that's at 6.30 as well. So if you'd like to register for that, you're very welcome to via our website. In January, we also have webinars on weight loss, um, orthopedics and gynae. So keep a look out for our future events for your friends and family. Um, so now just to thank you really, thank you very much, Mr. Garnet, for your time and your information this evening. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Hope yes, it was definitely. helpful. Thank you. <laughs> and um, yeah, thanks for my team for supporting this and um, have a nice evening, everyone. So thank Bye. you. Goodbye. Bye.